Um, thank you, thank you very much, and good afternoon. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to the students today to motivate you to uh, make a difference in the world through science. Yeah? Um, and uh, I had the luck to work with a group of fantastic people in my life. It's not me. What I'm going to talk about is what the team did as a in a small first, and then later in a large organization. And uh, it's a big lesson in life. Uh, your teams. It's not, uh, if you think uh, you do it yourself, uh, it's not going to work. It's going to be the teams you built in order to make it work. I'm first going to focus on, um, as Daniel was saying, a little bit on how I started and what, uh, where I came from originally as a physician in Africa. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, how I uh, worked at Janssen and, and changed a larger pharmaceutical company in innovation. Also touching on, on what can you do uh, as a collaborative effort in industry in order to accelerate innovation. And then I'll end with uh, how you can do global public health programs in a large company and still be successful. And uh, all of that in uh, hopefully 40 minutes. Uh, stay with me, yeah? Um, so this is me 30 years and 30 kilos ago <laughs> in Africa, yeah? And, um, I was as a student first, and later as a physician, I worked in, uh, in Kikwit in Congo, uh, now Congo Denza here. And Kikwit became very famous for one important thing. Uh, you probably know if you have worked in Ebola, that was the Kikwit strain. And Kikwit um, uh, was, uh, was the, at a certain point, a, an epidemic, uh, an, an, a very significant infection happened there. And many of my friends in the hospital, I was there, it was in 95, uh, I, I left Congo in 90, uh, and uh, it killed 395 people in the hospital, all, almost all nurses, all physicians. And so I never left Ebola behind, and you will see in the end why we invested in Ebola and why I never stopped doing that. Second, um, I was trained by a few people there. This is still when I was a student. I spent as a student every year in, in and here we are working on a polio patient. So when I came to Kikwit, I found we found 2,000 people crawling on the ground. And why was that? Because of polio and the absence of vaccines to polio. And so um, we, together with my good friend Jens, we operated on hundreds of them to put, put them back on their feet. And still now, 30 years later, the revalidation for polio is continued to go there. Jens played a very important role in my life, and you will see later why. So in this hospital, polio, TB, HIV, all of the, all of the disease I worked on for the rest of my life. Uh, but what I also found is like uh, in certain places in Africa, complete villages with no one between 25 and 45 anymore. So this was a typical family of a boy of 14, a girl of 13, two youngsters working on their own, living on their own, two chickens, one goat, parents buried in front of their house. That, was, that is and that was the situation in Central Africa at a certain point. When I worked in Kinshasa, through the door, when you walked through the door of the hospital, 30% of the people were HIV infected. I worked three years in Congo, one year in Rwanda. In Rwanda, in uh, Centre Hospitalier de Kigali, 70%, seven out of 10 people walking through the doors of, of the hospital had HIV. The diagnostic test was walking to the door of the hospital, open your mouth, see candida, HIV positive. Yeah? Life expectancy was less than six months. Cryptococcal meningitis killed many, many people. And so that was the basis where I started working in. And then I met, I had to leave Rwanda in 1990 because of the war. And I met Dr. Paul Janssen, uh, the founder of Janssen Pharmaceutica. And he said, why don't you join me to try to find a solution for HIV? I said, I don't think so. I'm going to back to Africa when the situation comes. But he convinced me to start six, to work six months with him. And I learned about HIV drug discovery and development. He had just discovered TBO, the first uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And he told me in his typical style, one day we'll solve this disease with one pill once a day. It will be available to everyone and people will live long time. Yeah? That was in, he said it in 90. Yeah? And he said, keep going, never give up. You will fail several times, but if you take this on, one day you will get there. Yeah? So where are we today? One pill once a day, exactly what he predicted. But we went through a lot of failures. So we started 
um, tackling the HIV virus. And the first four drugs I did with Dr. Janssen failed. So we had a non-nucleoside. We didn't know anything about the virus. We tested it. We went to the clinic. Four, one month later, no effect. After four drugs, we said, what the hell is happening here? And so we were the first to identify HIV resistance. I didn't discover anything in my life, but I was one of the first to identify HIV resistance. And that determined the whole future of HIV drug discovery. So uh, AIDS was ramping from 82 at a certain point. It's long before some, maybe some of you were born. Um, in 92, it was the most important disease, killing disease in the, in the United States. And it was ramping like crazy, yeah? And then when the combination therapies arrived in 94, 96, you see what happened. It very quickly went back. And it was thanks to multiple combinations. My friend Jens, who was the physician who was training me in Africa, uh, and he is fully consenting to me talking about this medical situation because he wants to be an inspiration to many. He was infected in 87. In 94, he had gone through all of the different drugs, and he had no, not one drug he was responding. He had zero CD4s, high P24, he had a tuberculum of three kilograms in his venter, and he had no chance to survive. Yeah? Um, he was operated for his tuberculum, and he said to me, Paul, do whatever you can. I took his virus, his blood sample, went to the lab, and with Rudy Powell's, we, dis we, dis we discovered that when we gave a particular combination of three new drugs, we could block his virus. Yeah? We gave it to him uh, with, in, in constant with the, with the physician in the IRB of the hospital, three experimental drugs. And two weeks later, he was back. One month later, he was back on his feet, and that's now, was in 94, and still today is alive. He has grandchildren, and he made it. Yeah? And he's devoted his life to, uh, to HIV in the developing world. And it's one, that experiment changed my whole career. Test a patient, resistant, use combination drugs, and it works. And we called it the Lazarus effect. It was like people standing up from the dead. Yeah? So 35 kilograms, no chance to survive. He survived. In the meantime, Jens has survived three cancers, went through all types of therapies. His viral load is undetectable and he is planning for a five-month bike ride through Europe now. So he retired a few months ago, he became 65. Um, based on NS1, I said we have to do two things, diagnostics and drugs. Yeah? So I, uh, Dr. Jansen retired, and I started with Rudy Powell, my very good friend and business partner. We started a, a, a company. Each of us invested $30,000. Yeah? So we rented a, a garage, and an old uh, uh, clean room from an um, audio company. We turned it around in a P3 facility for HIV, and we had one hood and two people. Sure. Anya, um, on the right side, was doing HIV drug screening, and Patricia, on the left side, was doing diagnostics, testing for, uh, drugs on strains of, of patients. Yeah. And that gave us uh, the information we needed to make new drugs and multidrug resistance. Fast forward, we became the largest HIV phenotype and genotyping lab in the world. This we did in total 600,000 sequences of HIV patients and informed physicians what to do with their patients and 100,000 phenotypes. Every phenotype was 1,000 cultures with all the available medicines in order to inform the physician what to do uh, for, for treating of patients. So we were paid something for that. The, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, partner here was the FDA. The FDA sent all the pharmaceutical companies to us to profile their drugs, so that we did in, on top of. All of what you see is plates here, high throughput mechanism showing uh, virus. Uh, we tested every virus, on, uh, every virus on all the drugs times probably 20, yeah, for all the controls, et cetera. With that, we informed physicians, and people got a report like this from us. Yeah? It includes all the genetic profiling and it, uh, against all of the drugs, and the physician could make an informed decision. While there was no complete suppressive regimen, we were able to keep many, many people alive across the world by this information. So we had the genotype, and later on, based on, first we did phenotype clinical outcome, then we did genotype phenotype, and then we did genotype clinical outcome. And then we were able to the genotypic 
mutation patterns to give people a um, sensitivity measure. Yeah, that was how we instructed, uh, uh, could instruct uh, physicians to do that. We did a study, prospective clinical trial, information, no information. So we randomized people to, uh, to you get your antiviral gram or not. And the difference was a full new drug in the regimen. Drugs get paid several thousand dollars, diagnostic hundred and fifty dollars. That was a big lesson in life too. Yeah? But so, um, then we started with this information to do big time. So I started to go around the world and bought a number of chemical libraries. I bought a library from Searle and some patents. I went back to Janssen, bought my own uh, research uh, uh, from, uh, or licensed my own research from before, and set up uh, big time chemistry, big time uh, research, and synthesized a few molecules. Uh, did a lot of uh, laboratory research, and then I'll show you this. These are 400 patients with multidrug resistant protease. This is the, the sequence of the protease. And you see already immediately, every lighting up is a mutation. Yeah? You see an incredible task to find a drug which covers them all. But we beat the virus on its own principles. Yeah? Um, so, and it's just not more, more difficult than playing on the lotto. A virus can easily, with 10, 10 to the 10 to the sixth virus per ml blood, half-life of two days, and 10% mutation uh, differences in every cycle, you have a whole swarm of viruses. Statistically, the virus could make four mutations right, or five. But we made two drugs where the virus had to make 17 mutations right. Never on earth a virus is going to be able, by chance, to have 17 mutations right. And it worked. Yeah? We, uh, we made a new drug, Darunavir, and some of you know the drug very well. Yeah? It became uh, the protease inhibitor of choice in the world, and today is the most prescribed protease inhibitor in the world. Um, it was able to, to treat multidrug resistant protease, as well as reduce the viability. So we suddenly had a medicine, which was for multidrug resistant patients. Um, we started clinical trials with this medicine in 2005, 2006. People who entered the study had three to six months life expectancy three to six month life expectancy. Most of them are still alive today, 10 years later. Today we have about 200,000 people, if not close to 300,000 people, who will live 10, 20 years longer because of this medicine and others. It's not just alone, but it's a combination. Um, uh, we've made a very in, in, impressive medicine recently, which is combined with many of these. So, uh, Presista, Intellens, Idurand, three of the medicines came out of my team. Uh, Idrand is combined with a lot of the Gilead and the JSK drugs. So these combinations are now one pill once a day. They become available to everybody and everybody should live a normal life. So that's that. Tico Kier was one of the first patients getting access to, um, in 2005 to the drug. And he learned from Jens because Jens was the first again to get to the new drugs. He learned through my, my friend physician. And Canada didn't want to import the drugs because they were experimental. He was painting his deadbed. Yeah? He was terminally ill on the left side. He painted as an artist his deadbed. He walked with five friends into the prime minister's office with coffins. Yeah? And they all brought a coffin into the prime minister of Canada's office and said, we need these drugs to survive. And they got the drug. Tico is still alive and uh, rowing Camp Vancouver Bay and uh, running marathons and climbing mountains. So um, now, on a global scale, and this is, this is the industry as a whole, including what, uh, what uh, Yusuf have been doing, is if you look at life expectancy in HIV, and you look at life expectancy in the world from 60 to about 80, the dotted line is the Western world. Africa was tracking on life expectancy almost with the, the rest of the world. And then the HIV epidemic hit. The majority of these countries, they lost between 15 and 20 years of life on a country base. Yeah? You can't imagine that, yeah? 20 to, um, 15 to 20 years. So with, drug, with prevention and with new combination drugs, life expectancy is slightly starting to climb up now. So um, HIV is far from over, but big things happened. This is a kid before and after, antiretrovirals, see what can happen. Yeah? Kids can recover completely. 
The ultimate goal is an HIV vaccine. We started a phase 2B in December together with uh, NIH, Harvard, and uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I won't go into detail, but it's a combination of prime boost, which we learned how to uh, uh, very much in Ebola how to do that. Four injections over 12 months. We had spectacular data in non-human primates. At this moment, doing a large study in Southern Africa, 26 centers, 2,600 very high-risk uh, girls will be included, and it's well on their way to, uh, to, get, uh, to get done. HIV is a success story from clinical endpoints to biomarkers, 40 drugs in 30 years, 20 to 30 pills a day to one pill once a day, now going into long-acting injectables, from two years life expectancy in 83 to almost normal life expectancy, that's a statement from uh, Tony Fauci from the uh, NIH, 17 million, maybe more now, on therapy, and pr the projection is at least 300 million years of life are saved by what has happened so far. And it could go up to a billion years in the, in the, in the next few years. So working to make HIV history, on the one hand, from resistance to treatment to one pill, on the prevention side, a vaginal ring for prevention, long-acting an HIV vaccine. Long-acting will also be useful in therapy, not useful, will be primary there. Uh, but um, one day it will be an HIV-free world, either through therapy or through uh, Going next, um, our industry. Um, in the meantime, we went to a big clash, uh, a crash in the market. Couldn't raise money anymore. I found my old partners back. I was acquired by J&J &J and became the leader of uh, R&D in Johnson & Johnson. Um, but overall, I think, and be, having worked with Dr. Janssen and having worked with so many re researchers, our industry has done a very important, has had a very important role to antibiotics, vaccines, and innovative treatments to get to new drugs and, and, and adding to life expectancy. But enormous challenges uh, remain. It's the non-communicable diseases. You can list them diabetes, Alzheimer, cancer, but also infectious diseases in the developing world. Still massive amount of uh, challenge with the pandemics, AMR, TB. Um, on the one hand, R&D is more costly and complex than ever, and was it simple, it would have been solved long time ago. The problems we have to solve now are very complex, demand very significant new uh, technologies. But on the other hand, I think there is not a better time than now with the new technologies and the new science to solve many diseases. And you heard that throughout the conference yesterday from CAR-T, from Rick. Um, you see that it's such, a, such an attractive world to work in. Won't go into details, but if you look at multiple sclerosis, HIV, hepatitis, diabetes, cancer, RA, vac and different vaccines like HPV, preventing for cancer, and, and so many others, the industry has contributed time after time medicines, which now address significant medical problems. And time, the time of me too, or me better, is almost over. If you want to have a company which functions, you have to focus on simple things years of life and years of quality of life. If you do that, years of life, years of quality of life, you find a way to make your company work, yeah? at least in the West. There is, of course, a whole other aspect of uh, I want to give one example in, on hepatitis, and we were a significant part of that. We started with, uh, with the 40% cure in that when we used interferon ribavirin. We developed two protease inhibitors, so we were able to bring it around 75% cure. And then the combination of, and I think Ray is gone, but Ray Shin Shinazi did a fantastic job with uh, Sofosbovir, which later ended up in, uh, in Gilead. The combination of that with the protease inhibitors got to 90%. And now um, the interferon-free combination antiviral therapies cure 100%. And in the last session, you discussed extensively the pricing challenge of this. But first of all, it was a scientific miracle to get this done in such a time frame uh, with such a... Uh, such an accuracy. Cancer, significant reduction in, um, in mortality, and more to follow. I think for cancer, we are only at the beginning of where we can go. Uh, with prevention, interception, and, and cure, we are going to go very far. And then, of course, personalized medicine. All of the tools which were discussed uh, by Stephen Friend and other, um, the, uh, uh, the introduction of, of digital in health will make a huge uh, impact on diagnosis, treatment, and cure by detection, prevention, and risk assessment. Now, the role of industry, and, as, and I'll talk a little bit about how we did it, um, is, is in fact being the connector between good science and the patient outcome. 
Yeah, you need an enormous amount of work and, and qu high quality work, very costly, to bring innovations to patients and bring it globally. It's a, it's a, it's a massive effort for all of uh, us who are involved in that. And, and so, what did we do? Um, we focused completely on medical need. I count the business not in dollars, but I, as a, as, a, as a physician and researcher, I count in years of life and years of quality of life. How much added value do we generate through our medicines in longevity of life and in quality of life? And that turns around into a very viable business model, at least for us in the West. You, you use internal innovation and external innovation and depth, depth of expertise. I would say you, you, can, you have to know what you talk about to make decisions in this space. You have, to have, you have to have expertise. And if you do that well, your probability of success goes up. If you select the right signs, then your you, uh, probability of success goes up another side. So extreme collaboration, internal, external, depth of expertise, and global development excellence, and fast. Yeah? Um, what we do is we make a scan of the entire scientific world in order to see, this is B-cell malignancies a few years ago, the number of drugs somewhere in development. Outside is in the lab, towards the center is on the market. So more than 150 drugs are somewhere in development. You have to know what's ongoing in order to be able to make the right choice and to make the right decision. Yeah? Um, and then you put them on this chart. Yeah? Innovation, and if there's one slide you have to remember, is this one. Time in years, level of innovation, and market expectation. Market expectation always goes up. Yeah? So you have to be extremely good in predicting where you have to go 10 years from now. And there you have to take in consideration all of the other players. Yeah? Then the innovation threshold, if you start at a low level of innovation and you go slow and you hit that line, there is no value. So you can lose all your investment if you're not careful. If you want to go, uh, then you have to go high on the level of innovation, have to go our speed, and the difference between the product where you went and the market is your value. And that's how value is determined in our world. Yeah? So you have to have a prediction for the future. Not if you do a market study today, it will not help you. It, you have to see where you will go. And then excellence in execution, large clinical trials. We do development today not by the week, by the month, but by the day and the hour. We plan clinical trials, we plan project, we have a project management system which is dealing with hours rather than days and months because, uh, because of the, the urgency, but also the value you can create by going very, very quickly. We did uh, about 18 new drugs in the last 10 years based on this system, very focused, internal, external. You can find this on the website, all of the drugs we are doing. Focusing on preventing, intercepting, cure. I'm a believer that we have to go earlier to be able to solve the medical problems in the world. And we are hardly working on that. We have fantastic internal signs from genome to, micro, uh, to microbiome, a new look at prevention, how can you get early interventions going, uh, diagnostics, um, spotting who gets ill, and then of course, big time immune system, how you use that. We have a very large external innovation engine. Yeah? Um, uh, the innovation centers today, four innovation centers, and, and there are many of uh, Robert and Richard are here, and Melinda is here from our team running J-Labs. We have four innovation centers in the world on three, on three continents. We did 290 investment in the last four years. Uh, we have about 170 companies and incubators. j, &J today, we have seven incubators in the world, 170 companies in there. We facilitate companies. Those companies raised on their own $10 billion. So they leverage the outside world to in the collaboration to bring more, um, more products forward. And then JDDC, our venture capital group, has invested in 83 companies, 1.4 billion. So we, we use, we have about five, 600 collaborations where we highly leverage the external. It's the diversity of the brain, the diversity of the thinking and approaches which brings the innovation for the future. And that's where we tap into the external world for making a very large company like j, &J work. Yeah? This is our network in the world going from east to west, west coast to east coast, to Europe, to, uh, to Israel, to, uh, and to Asia. And all our activities are across the world looking at the best signs, the best people, wherever they are in the world. Leveraging our industry. 
I learned also everything is about reducing capital and time to result. Yeah? So if you can leverage infrastructure, you, get le you reduce capital. If you can go faster on when doing this together, you, um, um, you, you also leverage a reduction in capital. So it is from basic science to translational development and in market. At all times in industry now, we are trying to look what are the pre-competitive sites where we can collaborate to go faster. And one example of that is um, Transcelerate. Huh? Transcelerate was launched five years ago. Today, 20 companies, 19 companies funded by the membership. And what we do, I give you one example. Today, there are 150,000 sites for clinical trials in the world who are cross-trained for the 20 companies. If you're, a, if you're an investigator and you get Novartis, JSK, and Johnson & Johnson, and they do a cancer study, you need to be trained in GCP. Before, everyone did it on their own. Now we do it together. So we are, we are creating the, the framework in which we can do research to reduce costs, to, to reduce the burden in society or in the investigators. We do that all together. We can now leverage our uh, placebo data. We, we exchange comparators. We, we have a common protocol. We work with all of the, uh, the, the, the regulators in the world in order to get to a better interaction on that. Large data, we have now access to 1.2 billion uh, patients in the world, uh, anonymized of course, to look for real world evidence as well as for safety. Today we find safety faster through the data systems than to the reports coming to us from physicians. That is the way of the future and uh, it's an enormous, uh, enormous work, an enormous statistical and data science activity, but uh, in collaboration with the universities now with several companies we are, we are able to really make it work. What could 2040 look like? Yeah? I'm uh, convinced that by that time we'll be able to have the right medicine to, for the right patient at the right time. Personalization, a world without disease, we should solve some diseases by that time. Yeah? Um, there are diseases which can be taken out, history has told us that. Example, TB. Access to medicine for everyone, a very big task, but should be possible. And lots of innovative partnerships and, and co-funding. Data science digital is going to drive this significant uh, implementation. And then a very important point is strong science education in order for people to understand what new medicines are and what new medicines bring. Now I want to quickly give a quick review on within a large company. We are now the largest prescription company in the US. You can still do things for the developing world. And it's very important that our infrastructure is available for diseases, for neglected diseases. And working on uh, XDR, MDR, Ebola vaccine, HIV, I'll give you two examples. Um, a response to Ebola. Yeah? Curcell, which we acquired several years, a long time, uh, five, seven, eight years ago, had been working with the US government on an Ebola vaccine, because after 9-11, the US was funding the high-risk viruses. And that was somewhere in the back of our lap. A few people worked on it, but brought it slowly forward. And we had a vaccine which was ready to go in the clinic at the moment Ebola broke out. We got together with the team, said, how fast can we do this? 12 to 18 months, we should be able to produce it and test it in humans. I went to the board of J&J and said, uh, I need $200 million, and we'll have a Ebola vaccine in 12, in 12 to 18 months. And 10 minutes, and the board approved it. They said, we go with you. I mobilized 300 people, 24-7. 18 months later, we had 2 million vaccines, prime boost, high quality produced, available. And we have now have thousands of people in clinical trials testing for safety, and with the FDA working on a uh, working on um, the animal rule in order to get the vaccine approved so that it is available before the next uh, epidemic breaks out. Yeah? It works. Yeah? Fantastic, our team could do it. And uh, we, have, we have still a, a whole team in Cambia on the, on the border between uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea doing a clinical trial at this moment. Yeah? So uh, I was with my team in, uh, in Sierra Leone during the crisis to set it up. And then we discovered bedacolin. And bedacolin is, uh, was the first new drug for TB in 40 years. And what we did was, on a high throughput screening, we, put, we had space, and a smart guy put TB smegmatis on there. And there was a high throughput screening ongoing. And at a certain point, um, 
just by coincidence, there was one molecule which inhibited TB and nothing else. And everyone was like, what the hell are we going to do with a TB molecule hitting only TB and nothing else? And one smart scientist, Kun Andri, said, I think this is something very special. It must be a new target. So we went on and found a new target. Um, first, TB is still a very important disease. Uh, in India, South Africa, China, and Russia, uh, you have a huge number of cases. Um, the incidence uh, went in parallel with HIV, very logic, went up, the immune system down, TB research, and today there are more TB patients with, with TB than there are HIV patients with active HIV. So it became a very, very important challenge in the world again after it was very much under control. Now back to, uh, back to the target. It was the target called, uh, called ATP. Yeah? And those of you who are in science, you say ATP, you never ever use as a target because it kills everybody. Yeah? But this was an ATP synthase inhibitor, only active on mycobacteria and on nothing else. So that was like a miraculous discovery. So if you look at the strains, all of the non-mycobacterium, all uh, no effect, all of the mycobacterium, very potent. Yeah? And this drug uh, was a unique finding. We worked for many, many years and could not find a, any additional molecule which worked on this same target. In the meantime, we developed it. And um, the first study was negative. We tested, uh, but tested, didn't test the patient long enough. So the, the drug, because it works on the respiratory cycle, needs time to inactivate the, the bacteria. We then went to XDRTB and we did a study which um, which is a very complicated study. Five drugs plus active, five drugs plus placebo. And Yusuf knows very well that's how XDRTB is treated. Six drugs. Yeah? Five drugs we did active on top of placebo. And we saw very quickly a reduction in time to negativation as well as a significant increase in response. Now, you should know, these are patients who are locked up for six months because they are a danger for society. They are in these TB institutions. They cannot leave because they are, if you get XDRTB, there is no therapy. We got a very significant response after all. And now people can go back to treating uh, on, on, uh, on out of hospital. Based on this study, the FDA decided to give us approval. Yeah? That was a fantastic support of the FDA to go forward. Fast forward, uh, this was five years ago. Now we have 43,000 people treated. We have a large registry shown an enormous survival benefit, and now it's rolling out over the world. In Russia and China, in uh, mainly Russia, India, South Africa, China is starting. They are host 80% uh, of the multidrug resistant patients, and uh, hopefully pretty soon it can be available to all, and we are working towards that. Now, even better, when we use bidacolin, there is no resistance towards bedacolin in the target, but the bacteria seems to go around it through efflux pumps. And we find four new targets, which nobody knew about, one somebody knew about, but m nobody knew about before of this. And that gives us now, um, we are now doing research on combining these three, four targets. And when we block them all together, we can completely block the replication of mycobacterium. So we hope that we can get to a completely new regimen for TB, for lepra and for uh, no, even latent TB, hopefully one day, but also for NTM, non-tuberculous mycobacterium, and get to, um, get to significant impact in the world with that. This is, was a breakthrough discovery in a non-commercial space where we hope we can make a huge difference in the world. And so our goal is el eliminate extensively and multidrug resistant TB and mortality and simplify regimens. 15 years of work, several hundred million dollars of investment, several hundred million to go, but it's absolutely worth doing this. To stop, to end, I'm going to have another message for all of you. I was a student so long ago, and it's, it's more about how do you do this as a leader? Yeah? I travel 400,000 miles a year. I live all over the world. Uh, I spend, uh, I'm in, on an annual basis, two times in India, two times in China, two times in Africa. I fly 20 times a year back and forth to, between Europe. It's only if you have a strong family and a strong environment to build on. And if it, was for my, if it wasn't for my wife who went with me 
to Africa, all over the world. I could have never done this, yeah? She grew, up, she grew our children. We have four children. And uh, although I didn't grow up with them all, all uh, with my kids because I was traveling all the time, they still love me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they say, hey, dad, go on, but we are having fun, yeah? And uh, but so uh, now I spend more time with my grandchildren so that I at least see them growing up. But I have learned one trick uh, in, uh, in, in my life is go on vacation uh, every uh, four times a year, take your entire family with you, sp spend some good time, but make sure you keep a strong basis in order to fall back to, because life as an entrepreneur and as a leader in the world is hard. You, have un you need unlimited energy, but you have to do it all. Yeah? Um, and uh, you have to stand up there all the time, enthusiastic, and making sure that you motivate people. But I can, I can tell you, it's worth doing it. Yeah? And stopping with this, I am a believer that, and it's not my quote, but serving others in your business and personal life is the basis for all happiness and professional success. Serve others, make sure you do that well, and you do it relentless. And if you focus on medical need and benefit, to patients and to society, your life will be a big success. Yeah? Don't focus just on money, focus first on what really matters. And with that, you can, with that, you can make a difference in the West and in the developing world. <laughs> no, thank you. Sit down. <laughs> Questions? So, I spoke to all of you, the students, all the rest knows what to do, but the students, you can have ambition, uh, you can have big ambition. When I started in uh, the hospital in Kikwit, I never knew where I would end up. But thanks to the inspiration of Dr. Paul and to Jens and to a few other leaders, I was able to do what I do. And, uh, and Paul Janssen was my biggest inspiration when he said to me, one day people will be cured by one pill once a day. Never give up. Yeah? Uh, the other time, the other lesson in leadership is, um, is one of cascading responsibility to the organization. And I learned that from Dr. Janssen, the principle you take the risk, I take the blame. The leader has to stand up for all the risk. If you cascade that through the organization, you can have an enormous productive organization. If you send blame down in the organization, everyone is putting up their umbrella all the time, and people will protect themselves in the organization. So you have to learn the principles on how to instill how you can work with teams. And it's a very important, uh, very important leadership message. And don't take yourself serious. Huh? Um, Eliza was saying yesterday, uh, don't think you know everything about everything. Uh, make you, you, the, the art in life is hiring people who are better than yourself so that you can move on and do different things. Yeah? Most people have, are afraid of doing that. But hire, if you are a leader, hire people who know more about the subject than yourself and let them make the decision. And even then you have to stand up from they take the risk, I take the blame. And that's how an organization cascades and how it works. So just a few leadership messages. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, thank you so much for all the great work you've done for uh, Africa and for the whole world. And uh, I'm from China, my name is Wei. and my question is, I'm always curious about how does the, how do the patients uh, pay for the vaccine um, for Ebola in Africa? I know you have done amazing work, but what about the finance? The patients will not pay, yeah, um, because that, is not work. That, that doesn't work. Uh, if you do an Ebola vaccine for a global crisis, there is, it's not about the patients. It's about the world preventing that epidemic from getting to the rest of the world. So we have had discussions with the government of the US, the governments of, of Europe, to make sure that the vaccine was there. And we will not stand in the way 
with any cost to make sure it gets to the place. Because the crisis, the last crisis in West Africa, caused a huge economic damage. Yeah? And that, that, um, these are the type of products which you have to do as part of return uh, to the world. Of uh, You get a lot from the world, you have to return to the world, and, and especially the Ebola um, vaccine. When you talk about certain other drugs, we have introduced tiered pricing. Yeah? For a TB drug, we introduced $30,000 in the US, $3,000 in the middle income countries, and $900 in the developing world. And still then, if people don't get it, we'll give it. Yeah? So um, you can do different ways of, of, of pricing. But it, it is a challenge. If a disease is present in the West, yeah, it's easy. HIV, huge market in the West, you can m make the drugs available. TB, there is no market in the West, or very limited. I think we, we had 200 regimens sold in the US so far. We had 45,000, 43,000, which went to the rest of the world. You see the difference. So there is no market. And there, it's, it's like a, a real, you have to figure out a way to, to get the right incentives, a little bit on innovation, and, and try to make it work. It's not an easy one. Yeah? Um, but some countries can pay. Yeah, they, they, Russia, for example, pays for the TB drugs. They, uh, they absolutely do because they have a big problem. They have the money, and they, we work with Russia to, uh, to get it to their patients. Um, so. Hi, thank you for such an inspirational talk. I really appreciate all your work that you have done globally and uh, within the United States as well. Um, you mentioned this briefly as a major unmet medical need, but uh, what is your perspective on Alzheimer's disease and what it's doing to the world, and what can Johnson do? Yeah, Alzheimer's is, um, is uh, one of the toughest scientific challenges and medical challenges that there are. And everyone in their family or their environment knows people with dementia. And you know if you lived with a patient or, or a family member. Um, the problem is that the science at the moment is not yet there. Well, there are some scientific avenues which we, we are pursuing also. Yeah, you know, bed amyloid, tau. Um, but the, the challenge is uh, we don't know enough at the moment to really tackle. What is going on in that big tube I showed you is that Alzheimer's is one of the core drugs where the industry together with governments is collaborating on. And, uh, so if you, the, um, you have the, the Dementia Discovery Fund, which is now a fund which is totally focused. I don't know whether... Uh, um, uh, um, I, Kate is here, Kate Bingham. Uh, she was going to be here, I think. Um, the, the, there is now SV Life Science with a, with a Discovery Dementia Fund, where in the meantime, Bill Gates and many others have contributed to, which creates now new pathways in Alzheimer's. Then there are huge, uh, very significant biomarker activities ongoing in the world between America and, you, and, and Europe on, on trying to find biomarkers which especially indicate early onset, but also clinical response. Um, and that's very important because we learned over the years that if you go into Alzheimer's, then typically if people have the neurological damage, it's too late to bring them back. Yeah? You, it's very difficult if the brain is damaged to still influence. So we try now to do early diagnosis and prevent that people get worse. That are studies which take six to seven years. It's a huge challenge yeah, to, to do that type of research. Um, and then what is happening now in order to shorten that, is with the, NI, with the NIH and in the, in the UK, but also in Europe, um, group, uh, companies with, with uh, the government have started like cohorts of patients, uh, um, um, research platforms where you can test single drugs, combinations, and you can minimize the number of placebos. So the, 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 the research platforms, they allow to f already follow a large number of patients and then test different drugs in. Then with the regulators, we are working on how can we accelerate based on biomarkers, based on, on, on that type of studies, access to these new medicines. So we are trying to shorten the pathway. We are trying to learn about the biology and we are trying to to get more new mechanisms going through uh, investing in, uh, and we are part, like JSK and others, we are part of the Discovery Dementia Fund. We all co-invested with the UK government and with so many, else, so many others to get that new engine of new targets going. So, but it's one of the toughest areas to tackle. Uh, and um, I would very much encourage, but it's a daunting task. Um, if you don't 
do it for anybody else, do it for yourself, because a large part of the population will get Alzheimer's or dementia. So including a big chance that one of us will get it. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again for such an inspirational presentation. Um, I want to touch on a key theme that seems to have propagated through many of your, your talks and uh, projects, which is actually using technology, applied technology, to save lots of people whose lives uh, you know, could not be uh, saved otherwise, you know, they actually have enough financial resources. In the US, uh, where I come from, there's been uh, a big conversation about uh, the sort of perhaps exploitive role that drug companies have been seeing. There's been a negative, big perception push yeah. in terms of drug pricing and, and people trying to maximize profit because it's such a central part of life. Uh, from your training, now being a leader of business, how do you manage to balance those two? How do you get communicating to your boards that the role of resources and yeah. increase sustainable change? Well, yeah, the, um, it is a challenge because there is a, an enormous amount of capital going into research. At J&J, we spend over 10 billion a year. Um, you, that money comes from the market, from shareholders. You have to give a decent return on that because it's high risk capital. Um, so my answer to that is, is uh, be as efficient as possible to create as much innovation as possible at the lowest possible capital cost and then we'll be able to bring prices down. Uh, some, some of our drugs, they have a very short life because of, of competition, because of, of regulatory exclusivity. And, and you have to, um, um, if, if you look at this and I say, we do like 18, 20 drugs in 10 years. We spend about six, seven, eight billion dollars over the years. That comes down to two drugs a year divide eight billion by two, you come down to three, four billion a drug, yeah? And of course we have a lot of failures, big failures. So I, we do better than that at the moment, but it, it's, that's what is, and to get that return back, we, we have to be financially responsible, otherwise we don't exist anymore. Yeah? So a lot of companies disappeared in the world because they were not able to make it work. The solution for large pharma companies is be innovative. Yeah? You will not survive if you're not drastically innovative. Generics in the Western world don't work very well. Biosimilars is a big hurdle because of, of it's, it's a huge challenge to bring it into the market. And so you have to be very innovative. And for us, it was the solution. We don't do anything which doesn't influence years of life or quality of life. And uh, we always cut down to those projects who prolong life or improve life. And then you make it happen. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's a very high hurdle. Um, and then you have to differentiate who can pay in the world and who can more difficult, it's more difficult to pay and try to find a practical solution to it. And for diseases where it really matters, like HIV, we absolutely do what's necessary to make it available to everybody. Thank you for your talk, it was really inspirational. My name is Madhura, I'm a PhD student from Singapore and my question to you is about antimicrobial resistance. So in the last few years we've all kind of woken up to the perils of that. I want to ask you what do you think is the realistic impact going to be on public health care and what can the pharma industry or the scientific community do to stay on top of that thing? <coughs> Well, um, first of all, it's, it's managing the antibiotics we have today and get much more careful on how we use them in today's world. Yeah? There are now untreatable bacteria everywhere in the world. In many places, orthopedic surgery is like a, a risk for you because of that. You don't, will not die anymore from anything else, but this is now the risk where you could die from or be lifelong handicapped. Uh, I have uh, close friends or, or and family member who went through that with a huge uh, challenge. So on the one hand, governments on, on the new antibiotics. On the other hand, um, new antibiotics, like we do with bedaquiline, have to be very carefully managed. Yeah? So bedaquiline is active on XDRTB, MDRTB. Everyone would like to have it. Of course, it's a good antibiotic. But we only release it through the national healthcare systems at this moment in the country. CDC releases it in the US. In Europe, it goes through only through the government. In India, in China, and in and, uh, and South Africa, only through the government on the proof of multidrug resistance and the proof that you have the com complementary medicines. I don't say that's ideal because the uh, countries are not organized optimally to make sure it gets to all patients. So we have to find alternative mechanisms to get it. But it's, uh, AMR will be, um, be anti-commercial. You cannot 
the best antibiotics will come and you will have to reserve them for AMR. Yeah? And that is, well, it doesn't work as a commercial proposition for, uh, for the industry. And there the world is talking on should we give a compensation for industry to do that, like a mar market entry. Uh, we have like for bedaquiline, you get a priority review voucher to have another drug faster approved. There are mechanisms to get some incentives set up, but it's, an ant it's, 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 uh, it's going to be a challenge. And at the moment, there are a few companies doing it. Um, um, we focus on TB. We didn't di discover any other, other new breakthrough in, the, in that area, but it's, uh, it's a big task as well. Diagnosis, do the right diagnostic limited the drugs to the right patients, and new drugs should be completely limited to uh, the people who need it and no, nobody else. Yeah. Um. Hi, my name is David from GSK R&D. I'd like to go back to the AHV that uh, you were mentioning before. I think it's one of the three diseases that still comes with a social stigma because traditions has been associated with prostitution, drugs, and same yeah. sex. So I'd like to know what are pharma companies doing or what can pharma companies do to eliminate the social stigma in HIV? Well, I think um, there, sh there is in fact no reason why it should still have social stigma uh, because um, um, now you can live a normal life. Uh, most of the people now infected with HIV and discovered and, and diagnosed early, you won't see it anymore. Yeah? Uh, many people in rooms where you will be in will have HIV, will be on their drugs, and you won't see it. There will be HIV viral load negative. They will almost be not infective. You always have to be careful, but not infective. So the disease is, is leads to, uh, I take my pills for hypertension. Yeah? I need to take my pills for the rest of my life to control my high blood pressure. It's not different anymore than that. The problem with HIV is that you need to take your pill every day and you can't miss any because you need to, uh, otherwise you get resistance. So I think what we do together with uh, Viv, and I think uh, the CEO of Viv is in the room, um, uh, on the long acting, it's really breakthrough on being able to, to do away with stigma is that people would have only one injection every second or one injection every month. So with that, you don't need to take your pills, you don't have to show it. Um, and in my opinion, uh, HIV today could be completely confidential. Nobody should know about it. Uh, um, you could live your life without, uh, without any risk. Um, um, and stigma, it should, uh, it's a shame that it's uh, still a stigma. Um, I think uh, sex is not a, uh, it, it's part of life now. So if you get the disease through sex, what's the problem? Yeah? Um, you get uh, obesity to eating, you get uh, high, bl <laughs> high blood pressure to, it it's, should be as much as a stigma than HIV. What's the problem? Yeah? So uh, don't tweet this. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you uh, for a very inspirational talk. My name is Sasha. I'm studying biomedicine at University of Copenhagen. Yeah? I uh, especially appreciate what you said about taking risk as a leader and also taking responsibility. But I was just wondering if you could shed some light upon this aspect of doing collaborations with other companies. So how J&J does it, how you do it, and maybe if you have some advice for uh, leaders who will hopefully be in your position in the future. Yeah, the um, risk taking in the company outside is, yeah, uh, outside the company we take risk by putting our efforts, our capital, our, our money into it. And you know, because you don't control it and you, are, you run a company, you can run it into the ground and we have to write down that investment. We, uh, we, can, we try to assist as much as possible to guide people. And as I was saying, um, the biotech, if, if I regret something in my life is that I spend too much of my money in biotech on building infrastructure. Yeah? In the days I was active, it was very difficult to find space, very difficult to find. But today, if you become a biotech entrepreneur, focus on added value in your product to the next step. Buildings, infrastructure are completely <laughs> secondary. It's nice to have a nice office, or, and et cetera, et cetera, but that doesn't matter. In the end, the, the, company go, the world goes to economic cycles, uh, ups and downs. And all of us have gone through an up and a down and probably two or three. And in the times of down, make sure you have enough cash to, to preserve to go through that. And that's where 
cash preservation as an entrepreneur is the most important thing to, to, to risk. So the moment you get cash, count every dollar, don't spend too much. Um, when I was with my Tibetan guys, when we went to a conference, um, we had two rooms, one for the girls and one for the boys. Yeah? And we were with five in one room and three in the other room. Yeah? So we were the massive cash preservation in order to get through to that. So investors take risk, we take risks, but we help companies to take risks. Yeah? So minimize your capital and, and minimize the time to, to next data point. It's always, it's always, you, you have money, you go to your next data point, your value go up, you raise money again. With that money, you go to your next data point, you raise value, money again, and you go up. Time to result and how much you result determines your future. So all cash should go to value creation, limited possible to, uh, to, to infrastructure. So use existing infrastructure, and that's what we do to JLabs. Yeah? You can come in and out within a week, we give infrastructure, you can join, and you, uh, and you, get, you get advice. And that's why that model is so attractive. And I'm a believer that the world should do much more for entrepreneurs to be able to, uh, to be entrepreneurial and to do cash preservation for, for value creation. Internally, it's, um, it's really um, you take the risk, I take the blame. Yeah? If, uh, and it, there's, an, of course, an other mechanism uh, that, uh, that uh, survive or perish. Uh, it's, uh, it, it has to do with we fail all the time. Yeah? And so if you don't learn, allow the organization to learn from failures, you don't get anywhere. Like I was saying with Dr. Janssen, we failed four times, yeah? our first HIV drug. We failed several times in hepatitis C. We've failed several times in cancer. Everyone is failing all the time. But it are only those who are successful who will learn from it. And so if you're a company and blame like, well, you're the negative and therefore, no, no, no. Well, the answer said, always said to me, we didn't think hard enough. What went wrong? Yeah? What did happen here? We'll try to understand. Was the pharmacology right? Was the spectrum right? Was the PK? Was there an interaction? Um, and so it, it, and if you don't create that failing condition, you better don't start a company, especially not in bioscience. Yeah? You have to be able to have a, a, a space where people can fail. Mm. I have a question along the same lines about external innovation and your engagement. Um, through JLabs, you had mentioned uh, you funded around 170 companies. My question was, what are some of the metrics uh, of success that you have in place to measure those engagements? And also, what is the level of patient impact that has resulted from external innovation? So on the first, I have to correct a little. We had already 270 companies in, uh, in JLabs. 100 graduated or didn't survive. Yeah? So we overall, over time, Melinda, correct, 270. 170 are currently there. Um, the metric uh, is, in the end, the number of collaborations for us. The metric is how many collaborations can we establish. Um, the long-term metric is, can we really get a new drug or a new device or a new product out of it? And Whereas the metric, we are five years going, we have a number of fundamental discoveries in JLabs, which we were able to bring through people who are now connected to us, and, uh, and we did deals on that, we co-invested in it. So for me, if there is one drug a year in the future which comes out out of the 250 companies, it's a success. It, uh, do, I don't need five or ten drugs, it's not going to happen either. Yeah, so some companies will end up with us, others will end up with other uh, folks. But it is the learning and leverage model. Yeah? It's, it's like facilitating more people to think different. It's the diversity of the brains, the diversity of the approaches. And when you do business deals, then there are, there are different things. Yeah? You can do a, a business evaluation of a deal and say it works for us or it doesn't work on the spot when somebody offers to you. It's totally different when you know a company for three years, when you know the people, the science, the evolution of the science, and what has happened in that time frame. And you get much more comfortable on making deals and collaborations if you know more about it. So it is a whole ecosystem we have created uh, in order to get to that. And why do we need that? We are 
north of $35 billion sales company in pharma, uh, uh, close to $80 billion in, 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 in the world for J&J, uh, for &J, 75 uh, going up. Um, in order to have enough innovation to make our company go, we need to find like 30 billion new sales every 10 years yeah, from innovation. That's like creating the next BMS or the next Merck. Or the ne we need to create a new company of that size every 10 years. And that's why we need the innovation of the world to make our company work. And that's the um, idea behind uh, uh, JLabs. I get the red flag, so uh, I have to stop here. But uh, thank you very, very much. Good luck with your career and enjoy. <laughs>